Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today, if you've got that sinking feeling, you're not the only one. On your screen, as you can see before you, is the key art for Cthulian Lovecraftian horror detective game, The Sinking City, which actually isn't bad. It's from developer Frogwares, and that developer, though small, uh, has a special place in, in my uh, backlog in terms of putting together Sherlock Holmes games and other mysteries, and, and this was a bit of a branch out for them incorporating this Lovecraftian mythos. However, like so many of their other releases, everything hasn't gone so terribly smoothly. So it wasn't really that big of a surprise when a few days ago, Frogwares put out a tweet that said the following. Frogwares has not created the version of The Sinking City that is today on sale on Steam. We do not recommend the purchase of this version. More news soon. And indeed, there's a lot more news as of today, all of which is interesting, some of which I might not have gone out with had I been asked for my opinion and was their outside counsel, but certainly well worth talking about here in virtual reality. Now, for such a small developer, they actually have been the focus, no pun intended, of virtual legality videos prior to this one because, as I said, they had had issues with their prior publisher. Frogwares just seems to get in trouble uh, with the publisher connections that they make. And The Sinking City is no exception, which is why, as of today, they went out with a blog post entitled How Nakon, their publisher, cracked and pirated The Sinking City, a step-by-step -step outline of how a French publisher stole, hacked, changed the source code, and tried to cover up the reporting trail. The following video and blog post that we prepared shows how our former licensee, Nakon, has cracked, hacked, changed our game's code and content, and illegally uploaded our game, The Sinking City, to Steam on February 26, 2021. Obviously, the version that they don't want you to buy because it's unlikely that they will see money from it. In order to commercialize it under their own name and without our knowledge, it's corporate bullying and incompetent hacking at its finest. But first, we need to give you some background to talk about what is even happening with this game. Since the release of The Sinking City on the 27th of June, 2019, Frogwares has encountered continual problems with its licensee, Nacon. Steam is one of the listed platforms of commercialization in the contract between Frogwares and Nacon. Actually, it appears that the contract is between Frogwares and Big Ben, and Nacon is a family affiliate of that company, but that doesn't really change what they're saying here. Since the release of the game, Nacon's unlawful actions have forced Frogwares to defend its property and react in front of the French justice, French court, for lack of payments, attempts to steal our IPs, which we made a public letter about back in August of 2020. Since then, Nacon has tried to force Frogwares to deliver a new master version of the game through the use of what? Their lawyers. Who can stand those guys, right? The French justice refused Nacon's demands twice, first in July 2020, then in October 2020 during an appeal. The final decision on whether Frogwares is obligated to deliver the Steam version that Nacon is demanding is still set to be judged in trial court in the next months or even years. The quick speediness of the justice system is the same all over. French, American, elsewhere. It just takes a long time to get these things settled, especially if you're going to have multiple avenues of appeal. But before we talk about this piracy charge, which is fascinating, we have to talk about the contract breach that is at the heart of Frogware's complaints here. So I've pulled up the blog post, The Sinking City is being delisted, here's why, from August of last year, in which they say, as some of you have noticed, The Sinking City has been taken down from Steam and many other notable stores. We were forced to terminate the contract with our licensee, that's the Nacon publisher that we're talking about today, for several breaches of our agreement. In 2017, we signed the Sinking City contract as a licensing agreement with Big Ben slash Nacon two years after the start of production. So it had already been started to be produced in exchange for a financial contribution to the development. They're going to pay for portions of the development. We gave them the right to sell and commercialize the game on four specific platforms, Xbox One, PS4, Steam, and then later EGS, the Epic Game Store. The intellectual property would still belong to Frogwares, which has always been the only producer and owner of its games, including The Sinking City. 
If that framework sounds familiar, you might be watching our A Lawyer Reads a Game Publishing Agreement series here in Virtual Legality, where we talk about the Raw Fury Game Publishing Agreement that they put out publicly and which enables us to read it through section by section. In the first section, we see how in a Raw Fury standard form agreement, and these can change obviously, the publisher gets certain rights associated with helping to pay for development and pay for marketing and things like that, but that the intellectual property, the game itself, under their form agreement is owned by the developer. And there's certain ways that you incentivize the parties and you can check out that series if you're more interested, but that that's how this as portrayed by Frogwares, and we kind of have to take it a little bit on faith when we see these descriptions, that's how that agreement works, is that they own the intellectual property, but they accept certain money from the publisher in exchange for the license rights to distribute the game on these set platforms and presumably some other marketing arrangements and things along those lines. During production, BBI, that's Big Ben, and Nacon was hundreds and hundreds of days behind in payments in total. They had a certain schedule they were supposed to keep in payments. Frogware says they didn't meet it. The lack of commitment to honor the financial obligations soon turned into ongoing pressure. Once BBI Nacon bought out a competing studio working on another Lovecraftian game, they dictated that we give them our source code for the Sinking City. That would be something that was negotiated or not at the outset of the agreement. If there isn't an obligation for the developer to turn over the source code, it can't come out of thin air just because the publisher wants it. Once again, BBI Nacon does not own the IP. They are a licensee. They sell the game. They don't develop or co-create. It's a good description of a licensee. After we refused to comply, we stopped receiving financial contributions for over four months, right? When you hear about possession being nine-tenths of the law, or it's better to have the money than not, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. This is a publisher that, if we take Frogwares on its face, and we have to for purposes of this conversation, the publisher says, oh, we asked for something extra. You didn't give it to us. How can we punish you without quite getting you to the point of just walking away? We're going to just delay and hold back the money that we owe you on the schedule that we owe you, or we're not going to approve milestones, right? We saw this with respect to the Dragonlance dispute, if you followed that here in virtual legality, where the other side just said, we're not going to approve any of the milestones ever again and which they had to be brought up in a lawsuit that said, well, that's not good faith and fair dealing under the contract. Certainly this wouldn't be if it's as described as Frogwares does, but they clearly have a problem. They have a friction point with their publisher. And that unfortunately is unlikely to get better once you get to this kind of situation as they're describing in August of 2020. Once the game was released, we received a letter from Big Ben Nack on that the milestones that were previously approved are being canceled, meaning that we would not receive any profit from the sales of the game. A retroactive cancellation on not delivering a product on time that is already out in the market is not acceptable. And honestly, that should go without saying. You want to talk about good faith and fair dealing. If this as is as described, you've got certain milestones to deliver. You have to deliver it bug-free. You have to deliver maybe an alpha or a beta, whatever it is going to be. It's going to be described in the document. The publisher gets a certain amount of time to approve it, and then it goes out into the marketplace, which is, by the way, a publisher-controlled mechanism in most circumstances. So they would have approved it, gotten it sold, gotten it out there, and now apparently had sent a letter saying we are revoking the milestone approval until you do something, until you fix it, until you give us the source code. And that at that point, we'll share the money. Obviously, you can see why if this is as described as Frogware says, they would have been upset about all of this. At some point, we received a statement claiming that one of the console manufacturers hadn't paid royalties for more than five months, while actually the same console manufacturer had paid our royalties from other games, presumably ones that weren't involved with Nacon or Big Ben, without any delay in the same period of time. They weren't getting the accounting that they should have been getting. And we talked about that in the series on the Raw Fury Agreement as well, which is if you're going to have royalties, if you're going to split profits, there needs to be a right to check the other side's numbers, right? One side, the publisher in general, is going to be getting the bucks into the account. And then they're going to say, you're going to get 50% of it. If you don't have the ability to check it, then you've got to take it on trust and nobody should be doing that in a sophisticated business relationship. So they had certain rights in their contract to say, hey, tell us what money we're getting. And that kind of Big Ben were apparently, as described by Frogware, is refusing. Furthermore, we were surprised to find that copyright notices on box covers and storefront pages were legally incorrect, creating a perception that it was not Frogware's which owned the IP. So during a lengthy and exhausting legal battle, we finally determined to terminate the contract on April 20th, 2020. And they actually posted this letter that you can check out for yourself. I'm only going to pull out little snippets here. But basically they say, the agreement provided for Big Ben and Frogwares to share the proceeds. No party was entitled to recoup any expenditure incurred by that party other than certain permitted costs that we defined in the agreement. 
Big Ben was required to account to Frogwares for the royalties, give them the financials to explain what's happening. Big Ben failed to account for the monies due to it. Accordingly, Frogwares notified Big Ben of this failure. In accordance with the terms of the agreement, Big Ben was required to remedy the breach, what we might call cure, within 30 days of receipt of that notice. And they didn't. So the termination clause says, if you don't do it within 30 days, we can terminate. So they terminated the agreement. This lawyer also points out that the IP ownership says Frogwares shall be the owner of the game and all IP rights therein, and then says the following, which is true. If everything else that they allege is accurate, it follows that any further distribution of the game by Big Ben Interactive or a party authorized by Big Ben Interactive after the termination date would amount to an infringement of Frogwares rights. When we talk about licensed and not sold, yes, that's an end user concept. It's also a publisher concept. If you are Frogwares, you created this copyright, this intellectual property, and you license out the right to sell it. If they breach the agreement, if they breach the license, and it's accurate, let's just forget all of the legal fighting for a second, just in terms of the platonic ideal of reality. If they breached the agreement, that license goes away and the exclusive rights to sell are restored to the original copyright holder. Specifically, as the lawyer says here, any such distribution would infringe the intellectual property rights of Frogwares as it is the only party entitled to exploit the game. So we're warning you. And if we have to get into a legal fight, we will, which of course is what happened. In our email exchange following that letter, Big Ben wrote that the contract cannot be terminated because of the emergency laws in France aimed to protect businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. That there were certain rights that France has given, and I can't speak to those rights, unfortunately, that said you can't do certain things, you can't change certain contractual relationships, et cetera, et cetera, during the pandemic. There are rules and regulations throughout many, many jurisdictions that follow these things. It's one of the things that has been really, really complicated for lawyers and contract attorneys throughout the last 12 to 14 months. However, Frogwares notes, this means that we are owed about a million euros and the emergency laws concept is actually covered directly in our contract. And again, we don't see this provision, but we would have expected it to be there that the force majeure provision that says if something really bad happens, if an asteroid is hitting the earth, if there's government takeovers of businesses, whatever, then each side might be forgiven its obligations for a period of time. Here they describe it as 60 days. If it continues for 60 days or more, if you can't mitigate it properly, that's another termination nexus. They say, so actually, if the emergency laws are protecting you, we have... 60 days of that going on, and then we can terminate it outside of your breach just because of the existence of emergency laws and the pandemic. So we've got a number of ways to breach, or right, we've got a number of ways to terminate. Moreover, on July 17th, 2020, NACON attempted to oppose the termination in court, as you might expect they would, but the judge rejected the demand, and the contract is now terminated in the eyes of the law. Kind of, right? As we saw, there is definitely an appeals process. Generally speaking, the contract is only fully and completely terminated when it's had its final non-appealable decision, whatever that highest court is, if your parties are going to continue to bring it. So it's in kind of a gray area here. Certainly, if they've won two kind of court cases, the original and the appeals, uh, Frogwares is likely to continue to win. Uh, but you never know how these things are going to go at the end of the day. However... While there was no need for NACON to formally acknowledge the termination, that's right, the other side doesn't have to acknowledge it. You don't need a certification or a signature, it's just gone. The former licensee had created a perception that is they who still own the sinking city. And so various partners and platforms like Steam are sometimes confused, overly cautious, or preemptively delist the game themselves while dealing with our request to return full control of the game to Frogwares. Given these breaches, ongoing hurdles, and an unwillingness to cooperate, Frogwares' last resort was to request the removal of the Sinking City from any remaining stores to at least halt any further sales going directly to NACON, right? So their accusation here, and we can't speak to the validity of this entirely, though they certainly paint a fairly fulsome picture, is that NACON was out there, lost two court cases, was otherwise causing trouble for them, and also not helping them clear things up with the actual platform holders where they, Frogwares, can get money. And because of that, they decided to pull the whole thing down in August of 2020, which makes a certain amount of sense. They get control of it back. They figure out a good partner that can defend them from these kinds of issues. And Nacon doesn't make money for this interregnum period where Frogwares can't quite get them to stop, can't get them to account for the money that has been made, which leads us to this crazy, crazy story today, right? So on February 26th, to our great surprise, we found a new version of The Sinking City was uploaded to Steam and launch. But Frogwares didn't deliver such a version. And this is not the first time something like this has happened. 
Alain Falk, Nacon owner and CEO, warned us on December 28th, 2020, so a couple months ago, in writing that you have 48 hours to upload a new Steam Master. Otherwise, we will use all solutions available within the law and the contract. And 48 hours later, Nacon purchased a version of the Sinking City through the site Games Planet and uploaded it to Steam like it is a Steam version. So we're going to talk about the details here because this isn't actually the February 26th launch. But what happened here is that you've got Nacon. And let's just take it with the grain of salt, devil's advocate, and pretend that Frogwares is maybe hyperbolizing its conversation a little bit. And Nacon thinks there's something legitimate in the contract that says, well, look, we paid for some of the development. It's a pandemic. The force majeure shouldn't kick in to allow you to just terminate. Maybe we aren't guilty of some of the things Frogwares accuses us of. Now we've got money in your satchel that we helped pay to develop this game. And we don't think that the agreement was properly terminated. We think we were meeting our end of the bargain. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is really high level devil's advocacy because certainly what Frogwares has described would seem to raise all the red flags and ring all of the alarm bells. That this is a publisher that's trying to go around the legal system. But if we pretend that, if we pretend that for just a minute, you can come to a situation where you can imagine that a publisher thinks it is getting taken advantage of by a developer. And then what then should they do? They think they have the right to distribute this thing on Steam and elsewhere that has been agreed to. They paid for it. And then they go and do some stupid things. In this case, they buy it from a different store and then they upload it as if it was the one that was given to them through their own agreement. Now, that one was obvious because Games Planet is all over it. So Frogwares contacts Steam. It says, it's a stolen version. Steam says, oh yeah, that's not great and takes it down. What happened a couple of days ago? Well, it got a little worse. Today, as Frogwares describes, we discovered yet another unknown version of our game. And what we found is that Nacon, a publicly listed company in Paris, valued at over 700 million euros or around 700 million euros, is yet again behind it. This is now Nacon's third public attempt to publish a pirated PC version of our game, with a previous attempt being made via Utomic in February 2020, about a year ago, and the attempted upload in December 2020, which is described above. Now, before we get into what Nacon did and why it's wrong and, and self-help is not something that the courts like or that the justice system likes, one question that might be asked is, let's say that we did think Nacon was on the right side of things, or if we just imagine a different publisher-developer relationship, and I'm sure we can't imagine a situation where a developer does something bad and tries to rescind the right and create trouble for the platforms, and the publisher did nothing wrong. What should the publisher have done? The court and the justice system really does generally abhor self-help. You aren't supposed to just go and buy it separately and change some stuff on the front end and put it back up and these kinds of things. There are circumstances where a judge might go for it, but in general, the proper action is to sue them for breach, just like Frogwares is suing Nacon for breach. You say, hey, look, we paid for these rights. They are causing trouble for us. It's a breach. It's unfair competition. It's potentially a tortious interference with the contractual relationships between a third party and ourselves. A whole bunch of other stuff that we have seen described in virtual legality. They also could have countersued when Frogwares sued them in the first instance about the breach of contract in and of itself. They didn't win those first two cases. They didn't appear to have countersued, at least Frogwares didn't describe it. So then going behind the court's back, in essence, and doing what is described in this blog post, if we assume its allegations are true, are very likely to look like a bad actor, like unclean hands, and really cause problems for this company, Nacon and Big Ben, in the future, if it is as described. It's probably the reason, if we are honest about it, that Frogwares went public with a statement like this one. So what is their statement? Well, they think that they pirated the Games Planet version. When launching the game version that Nacon released on Steam on February 26th versus our version specifically prepared for Games Planet, you can see the following differences. The Nacon logo has been replaced by the Games Planet logo, or has replaced the Games Planet logo. The loading screen is different. The Games Planet logo is removed. The advertisement for Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 is not present. The mention of a distribution platform on the lower right is not present. The more games menu option is not present. We took a look at the data that the Steam version made available for sale on February 26th and noted that the folder names and structure are identical. The executable has a similar name, but is of a different size. The packages are 17 gigs. This size corresponds to the versions created around summer of 2020, after that letter, after the difficulties they had already had with Nacon and Big Ben versus the 30 gigabyte size that was the only available PC version prior to that point in time. So they, they think they went and grabbed this version from Games Planet. And it certainly looks like they were right as we continue on. In order to make changes, Nacon had only one way. 
to decompile or hack the game using a secret key created by Frogware since the totality of the game's content is archived with an epic Unreal Engine encryption system. To be clear, this is hacking, and when hacking has the purpose to steal a product and make money with it, it's called piracy or counterfeiting. And the names don't really matter. They can vary by jurisdiction, certainly in the U.S., and this isn't French law. French law is going to be different on these kinds of questions. We have the concept in the DMCA, not that DMCA that does the takedown notices for you YouTubers or Twitch streamers, but separately that says no person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title. And what does all that legalese and definitions mean? Well, circumvent a technological measure means to descramble a scrambled work, decrypt an encrypted work, or otherwise avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological measure without the authority of the copyright owner, which it seems to be is pretty obviously frogware, presuming they didn't you know, fraudulently change the language of the contract that they presented to the other side and to the court, which I think we can generally assume. And a technological measure that effectively controls access is a measure in the ordinary course of its operation that requires the application of information or a process or a treatment with the authority of the copyright owner to gain access to the work. The encryption key, right? So in this particular instance, if we were under U.S. law, you would have a claim for a DMCA violation, a violation of the Copyright Act that somebody deliberately hacked into your service to circumvent the technological measure that was protecting the copyright that you put in to protect that copyright. The first step of NACON, as described by Frogware, was to obtain the key of encryption. By the way, they say in a lightly passive-aggressive parenthetical, we are aware how they got their hands on the encryption key, and we are going to submit our findings to the court. Stay tuned. After decrypting the archive, Nacon had access to the config files, the game files, and the game executable. What we did is that we downloaded the Steam version that Nacon commercialized, the one from February 26th, and we used our own encryption key on the archive, and it worked. The hackers didn't even care to use a different encryption key than the one we created when recompiling. Now, that's an interesting piece of evidence, right? You've got this situation where they are hacking into and re-uploading a game that you say they don't have rights to, and you're probably right, but we have to use that alleged language here, of course, in virtual legality, because we don't know. We're not in the room. We don't know the specifics and facts on the ground here. And if you are, again, giving the devil's advocacy point to the publisher, if they think they have the rights to it, even if it is self-help, there's no real need to necessarily change the encryption key because they think they are doing what they have the right to do. They have a lien on that equipment in that warehouse and they can go in and go get it. They can hire a repo man to go grab that equipment and get it out of there. Technology is a little bit different though. And certainly when there is a pending litigation, it certainly doesn't look good for the court system. Continuing, they have some really good evidence that this is, in fact, what happened. They give some pictures that show the file structure. And then my favorite here is what they did to change the logos because they didn't want to mess up the kind of system structure here is they changed out the file directly for the other named file. So the name of the Nacon logo file as discovered by Frogwares here is gamesplanet underscore logo underscore video, which of course was the original video that says gamesplanet, but the Nacon logo is now called gamesplanet logo video. It's pretty close to a smoking gun on this kind of stuff. Similarly, the splash screen that no longer includes a reference to gamesplanet is called gamesplanet underscore UI underscore MM underscore splash underscore screen, which again, pretty close to smoking guns on this stuff. Nakon also removed the platform watermark. This version of the Sinking City is for exclusive distribution for Games Planet. Hey, you know what? At least they're pirates and hacking and paying attention. You really don't want that on the opening screen. God knows other sites and places around the internet have forgotten to get rid of watermarks before much to our amusement on Twitter and elsewhere. The play more option leads to dynamic content with links towards external servers. This dynamic content is also used to check and verify what version is used. It is a non-intrusive security measure made specifically for pirates and hackers, which raises some interesting questions. I'm not sure if it's obvious if you go and you click on that button on the PC that it's doing that, that it's checking for those kinds of things. Um, and that might be one thing that might pop up in the privacy statements and things along those lines. But certainly it means that they can't track this version without that concept, which is what they say in the next couple of paragraphs. Nacon modified both the game executable and the config files inside the packages to do those things. We believe Nacon did this to hide the fraudulent exploitation of the game on Steam, but also on other portals which they may be planning to send the game to. Nacon wants Frogwares or anyone, including the French Justice, to never know the true scope of their exploitation of the game. Maybe. Although it might also be the case that this server connects to other games to be sold by Frogwares, and this is effectively a war between this publisher and the developer. So I understand why they are saying this, 
but it may not be the case. And it's probably not terribly useful to their legal argument about why they're doing this anyway. If they did it, they're going to get in trouble by the court system and bad actors and unclean hands anyway, regardless of why. They also note, however, that changing those components rather than just flipping out the video screens and things is harder to do. Note that in order to hack and pirate the executable, Nacon needed even more complex tools than hacking the game package. And that's worth noting. They actually show that this is a much trickier thing. Now, I think one of their bigger problems and one of their bigger points against Big Ben and Nacon is the following. Nacon pirated the deluxe version of the game. This version features content that was developed after the original release of The Sinking City by Frogwares. Nacon didn't pay for this content or even try to discuss it with us. There was a version of this game, The Sinking City, that had more stuff added to it after the Nacon deal fell apart. So even if Nacon, with that kind of devil's advocacy position, has some rights to the intellectual property and to continue its licensing and marketing out for Frogwares, it wouldn't necessarily attach to this separate version. Now, again, it would be unusual for a development and publishing agreement to not contain rights to certain of this other stuff. So there might be things that are happening behind the scenes in the agreement, but if Frogwares never got paid and if their termination was legitimate and everything else, which certainly the court seems to have sided with them twice now, then this is a very good piece of evidence that at no point should Nacon had the right to this additional materials. Nacon then requested keys from Steam to commercialize the game on platforms where Nacon doesn't have any rights to commercialize the game. And again, the contract, at least as described by Frogwares and in the letter created by their solicitor says, the only PC things that we talked about was Steam and Epic Game Store, which I believe was a follow-on edition after the original contract because it was only created a few years back. If they are collecting Steam keys, Nacon is to put on other platforms. Again, that's a bad actors and unclean hands problem because even if the agreement still existed, it doesn't appear that Frogwares actually licensed out the right to commercialize their game on platforms other than Epic Game Store and Steam. So what do you need Steam keys for Nacon? Again, an entire set of somewhat circumstantial evidence that is created into a mountain of bad actor possibilities for Big Ben and Nacon. Nacon then submitted the version to Steam who were in no way informed of the game's pirated state. This version was then offered by Nacon to all the listed legitimate distribution sites without them being informed that this is a pirated version. We don't blame Games Planet. We don't blame Steam. This is a bad actor in Nacon. And by the way, when we make a blog post like this and we have a paragraph like that, Steam, Games Planet, anybody else, you should be looking at your license agreements because undoubtedly a publisher on Steam has promised to Steam that what they are putting up there doesn't infringe on the intellectual property rights of another. They're making these representations and warranties, promises about the content they are putting on that platform so that Gabe Newell and Valve and Steam don't get burned by a third-party infringement lawsuit, which Frogwares could potentially bring if Steam was otherwise contributing to infringement. Same with any other platform. So this is a little bit of a warning bell to those big platforms that you should take a look at Nacon and Big Ben and think about whether you should be doing business with them because they're infringing and they are not protecting you or they're not complying with the license that you put in front of them. Finally is the section that I talked about at the top of this video that I probably wouldn't have brought in this way. Because this is some internet sleuthing, some Sherlock Holmesing, no pun intended for Frogwares, of course. They make some excellent Sherlock Holmes games. But where they go and try to figure out who made these changes and make the accusations based on that. It was not the butler. Now that we found out how they hacked the Frogwares game, we were also quite surprised to see who did it and who specifically uploaded the pirated version of the game for release. Luckily, the Steam client shows credentials of the person working with the builds. The account... Neopica underscore FH, when clicking on it, simply shows the name on the screenshot below. Philip Hodakiti. I did my best in the pronunciation there. Philip, I apologize if I messed it up. So we Googled it. Always a good plan when you're making legal claims and putting them on a giant multinational blog. And soon realized the name matches that of the founder and managing director of Neopica, a Belgian studio behind titles such as Hunting Simulator 1 and 2, FIA, Euro Truck Racing Championship, and another 60 games. Yep, they Googled it. Philip Hodakiti is the technical director of his studio, a programmer with more than 20 years of experience. His experience is exactly the one needed for someone working on compiling games on a daily basis. And Neopica was acquired by Nacon in October of 2020, so last fall. Again, I don't have a problem with the circumstantial evidence here, but when you are going out with a public statement related to an ongoing litigation, probably not a great idea to just start saying, we Googled somebody and here's who we think is responsible for what would be a federal crime. 
without greater evidence. I just don't recommend it. Obviously, I'm not Frogware's counsel. None of this is legal advice. This is entirely informational and educational here in virtual legality. But you got to be very careful with these things because if Philip Hotakiti isn't responsible and somebody was potentially using his name or otherwise, what you've done here is you've defamed him and that could potentially bite you in the butt. So you just want to be very careful when you're communicating these things and accusing people of crimes out in the open like this. In conclusion, Nakon has proved they are willing to do anything possible to serve their interest, including illegal actions. They ignored the decision of the justice and bypassed them pirating the sinking city in order to deceive their partners. Steam in the first place. You paying attention, Valve? Says Frogwares. But what is the bigger picture now? What happens now that our contracting party stole our assets and can use them their own ways without any limits? There are long-term damages we need to take care of. Nacon unpacked our data, stole our source code, and used it. Nacon can create a new version of the sinking city using our assets. They can resell, reuse, recycle our content and our tools, etc. We have to take the measure of what happened now and follow the best path on the legal side to prevent anything like this happening again. The owner of Nacon, Elaine Falk, will have to face the legal consequences of the decision of pirating and stealing Frogware's property. Incidentally, intellectual property laws in France are rather serious and can lead to up to seven years in jail and 750,000 euros of fines plus damages, as the Article 335-4 from Intellectual Property Code points out. We have full trust in the justice to see these actions considered as they should. Now, that is all a cease and desist letter writ large in black and white in public. The breach of contract claim that Frogwares describes in its August blog post and again describes here is not necessarily sufficient to bring an infringement of intellectual property claim separately. So what they might have to do, what you want to follow this story on is are they going to bring a separate lawsuit against Nacon, against Elaine Falk? They've referenced him twice in this blog post saying that there was a deliberate and willful intent to infringe, to steal their property and follow on with potentially an amendment to their current claim, another lawsuit, whatever it might be. That's what this represents to me when I read paragraphs like this. It also could represent a settlement tool. Look, stop all of this, get rid of this, take it down, or we are going to punish you in court. And this already looks bad for you. So what you are seeing, and I don't necessarily recommend it, I don't recommend it to my clients or in other capacities, is what amounts to a legal fight, a lawsuit kind of fight that is being put out in public because Frogwares and its corporate messaging department thinks that this is the most damage they can do, the highest leverage position they can take. And certainly here in virtual legality, we find it absolutely fascinating. Nacon certainly looks, as described by Frogwares, like a bad actor here. It will be very interesting to see if Nacon has any defense to these activities, whether they go public with any of their statements, or they just choose to remain silent and take it through the courts of law in France or elsewhere. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy these conversations, we are talking about the business and law of video games, software, big technology, and pop culture in general all the time. Consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon. We've got Streamlabs tips. We've got a store that you can see below in the YouTube video. If you don't like any of those options, though, just consider subscribing, ringing the bell, doing the Google dance, leaving comments for the algorithm, and most importantly, just telling your friends that we're here. This is a great channel I'm very proud of. We've had continued growth really consistently for a long time now, and more and more people are having a conversation with us on these topics, and I couldn't be happier. Every little bit counts, so if you just tell your friends and subscribe and do those things, I couldn't be happier, and I thank you so, so much. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching, and if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.